welcome to Lok Sabha Television. You are watching Climate Matters. I'm Suman Sahai. In today's um, discussion, we have two very interesting and very competent people with us. Uh, Mr. Prabir Purkasta, who is with the Delhi Science Forum and an energy expert, and uh, Mr. Nitin Desai, who is on the Prime Minister's Council for Climate Change. Welcome to you both. Thank you. We will discuss today uh, how energy contributes to climate change in the sense of energy consumption means emissions, and this creates the greenhouse gases that are responsible for climate change. But to what extent is India, with its very, very low growth uh, on energy and very low consumption, how much of it uh, would, should be calculated in the international negotiations? And we'll talk to both to find out about where India stands and what we should do in terms of cutbacks. Nitin, let me ask you first. Uh, India is, is, a, is a very low emitter of greenhouse gases and of carbon. And I have some figures here which says that over 40% of India's population lacks electricity access. And of this 40%, it's only one-sixth that even reaches the consumption of 100 kilowatt hour, as against the United States where the average consumption is 900 kilowatts per, um, 900 uh, kilowatt hour. So with this kind of consumption, what do you say about con cutting back on our um, I don't emissions. think the question of cutting back arises. And in fact, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change explicitly recognizes the importance and primacy of development and poverty eradication in developing countries. So that is a principle mm -hmm. on the basis of which the global negotiations take place. So one thing which we have to get across is, in our case, our energy policy cannot be based simply on carbon emission control. It also has to worry about energy poverty. It also has to worry about sustainability issues other than carbon, uh, which are also sub, uh, which do also arise in the case of uh, energy. It also has to worry about energy security. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I don't think anybody would argue that India's energy policy must be built around emissions control. Emissions can be there as one part, but not necessarily as the only part of a policy. And yet, uh, Prabir, um, as, you, as you heard Nitin say, that we have energy needs. And um, with our kind of development needs, can a really low carbon growth economic model uh, be viable? And also, there has been a recent report which says that all of the savings made by the rich countries, all their efforts to cut their emissions, has been nullified by the growth in emissions in China and India. What would you say to that? Let's first be very clear that no, none of the rich countries have cut back their emissions. Nobody has? Nobody really has. If you take the aggregate emissions from the rich countries post-Kyoto, including Japan, the United States, and Canada, mm. you would see there is net really no cut taking place over there. So you say this so is propaganda? So some countries have cut, but aggregate the cut has taken place because Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, after its breakup, the constituents, they have had a cut because of slowing down of their economy or actually deindustrializing partially. G aggregate Western Europe and the United States, Japan, haven't really cut their emissions. Some, yes, but aggregate, no. Mm -hmm. So that's point number one. Secondly, I think, as Nitin said very correctly, it's very clear that some countries will have to grow their emissions, mainly because they are below subsistence in India. Although 50% of the people have no access to commercial energy, and commercial energy is the one which we are talking about in terms of fossil burning of fossil right. fuel and so on. So there's no question, and accepted globally, except perhaps the United States, which also talks about large emitters like India cutting. Our cutting is basically if you take per capita basis. So Indian per capita basis is well below even the target emission for 2050 per capita, which is about two tons per capita emissions. So we are way, way below that Today. at the moment. Today we are about 1.3 tons per capita, 1.4 tons per capita. And where so will we be in 2050? You see, I think by 2050 we would have gone up and then come down again because that's what the, some of the countries will have to do. And certain other countries which are already way beyond the global average, take the United States, which is 20 times our emission, per capita emission, mm. is about five times the global average, they have to come down and come down drastically and they have to come down quickly. 
because carbon dioxide is a gas which doesn't really wear out in the atmosphere. Mm. It stays for a very long time. Mm. So you are talking of cumulative emissions that are there in the atmosphere, not flows. What everybody is talking about currently is really the flows of emissions. Mm. What they're not talking about is the stock of emissions. Correct. And this stock of emissions is the one which you can do as a carbon budget. If you do the carbon budget, you will find 20% of the world's population have grabbed, as of now, about 75% of the world's carbon space as it is existing today. Correct. We are talking about the leftover budget, which is roughly, roughly, if you take it, it's maybe 750 gigatons of carbon space that is there. So now, that is space is what we are fighting about. In mm. that also, they are basically saying, everybody reduce flows will come to a common point, mm. but from a very high point. Right. So, they are effectively talking about grabbing so the So, what you are saying is that out of 100 spaces where we could have emitted carbon, the developed countries have already occupied 75 spaces. As of and current. Yes, as of yes, current. Yes, as and, of current. And carbon stocks, other than agriculture and forestry, there is no other way to reduce carbon stocks. Carbon so stocks, we are you see, agriculture and forest, if you grow more forest temperature, Temporarily, yes. yes, but in a long term sense, no. The only thing that happens is the carbon dioxide dissolves and goes down into the ocean deeper layer. No, I mean, and you will fix amount. carbon through photosynthetic process. But coming back no, to that, Nitin, what you were saying, um, you, did you want to make a comment I'm on just that? Just go to a quick point. Mm -hmm. The increase in emissions in the United States after 1990, the increase mm -hmm. is as high as the total emissions from India. Tell right, me. Let's so just let me let's just put it this way: from 1990 to 2010, in the last 20 years, they have you, they have basically put, uh, um, uh, you, the extra amount is the equivalent of one India. So in that is States. that is the difference that we must understand. So if there's a difference, you must understand. I think there's no question that we have to hammer this point over mm. uh, across. Uh, the carbon budget uh, dimension is receiving attention now, and uh, there is increasing interest now in trying to do these things in terms of how do we fairly share the remaining space. Right. Let me just say this, that uh, India's emissions, I don't think will, they will not even exceed three tons by 2030 on standard projections and right. so on. The point I think we have to bear in mind is we cannot reproduce the energy path of the developed world. Even if I have no climate agreement, even if there is no global agreement, the practical realities of the availability of fuels, etc., uh, the practical reality of the impacts of climate change are such that we have to recognize that we have to have an energy path which is different. And my second point I would want to stress is that there are many things we need to do to meet energy poverty which are actually positive from the emissions point of view. Take, for instance, reaching energy to remote areas. Where renewables make Can excellent sense. Explain trends. energy poverty. When you mean energy poverty, you mean lots of people who are deprived of energy. Absolutely. So and uh, who need and energy. many of the things that we have to do there uh, are things which uh, are quite positive from an energy, uh, from a carbon emissions point of view. Energy conservation makes a lot of sense. From How the good have we been on implementation of the Energy Conservation Act? I, I would say India has not done too badly. If you look at the numbers in terms of how what sort of improvements we've had in energy efficiency mm -hmm. over the 90s and uh, the noughts for the past 15, 20 years. It's quite impressive. All and across all sectors? Um, where the Which big the increases sectors? have been, improvements have been in the industrial sector right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's a lot more that we need to do on the appliances sector. Uh, and there is a great deal that we can do also on demand management, which mm -hmm. uh, would help. So there is a lot of buildings. Buildings is an area which is virtually untouched in mm -hmm. India. Uh, How much of a difference would that make? I mean, industry, we all understand, makes a huge difference. You bring, da you bring up the energy efficiency of uh, industry, you I feel would say that, that uh, buildings, if you look at a 2030, 20 for the context, can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. India is a rapidly urbanizing yes, uh, is. country. Uh, the uh, energy use in cities is increasing, not just for transportation, but even for air conditioning and uh, lighting and so on. So uh, I ha cannot give you a toss out a number straight away, but there would be significant gains from the uh, improvements that you can make in terms of energy use in buildings. But that's a big goal. We have not done much. Right. We are not building energy efficient uh, At all. structures right. right now. Even though perhaps we don't have heating requirements, we do have cooling requirements. These yeah, are the big energy requirements, your lighting requirements. Right. How many hotels have you been to? where you, you have light on in the middle of the day. Yeah, absolutely. And there's daylight waiting for you right, outside. Right, 
uh, any number. Right. Praveet, um, we've been talking about energy efficiency and Nitin just said that we can't follow the same path as the developed countries, etc. Which brings me to the next very obvious one about renewables and alternatives. How are we placed with that? Where are we on that? You know, let me sort of step back a little when you talk about, say, the low carbon path that mm -hmm. you raised earlier. Let's be very clear that you would require low cost energy which would be high carbon path at a certain point of development. Such as? Current point of development because the cost of the low carbon path, path is very high. Take Can renewables you give us an for example? instance. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you examples in that sense. Let's take for instance renewables. Renewables, wind, yes, it has a certain cost. We are putting up wind stations, but our wind resources are low and the peer plant load factor of wind is about 16 to 18 percent, which means for 5,000 megawatt wind, you get really 1,000 megawatt equivalent of what you would get in a coal-fired plant. Mm -hmm. So effectively, your capital cost, which may look comparable when you look megawatt to megawatt, in terms of the energy produced, is really at least Much two less. to three times more, mm -hmm. if not that. So that's no, wind. Wait a minute. Let me just yeah. get this straight. So if you put up a wind plant, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the investment that you make in that, for that you comparable to coal, do you get uh, less energy? You get about 20% of the energy you would get from a coal fired plant. So because the PLF is much correct, lower. Correct. Wind does not blow all the time. Correct. You won't have okay. any of the uh, energy costs of the coal plant. And wind is, wind is close, I, to, I, wind I, is close taking, to grid parity yeah, now. I'm taking, actually, it's in that sense, I'm talking about the amount of energy you require. It's not the capital cost alone. And I would say the capital cost, that's why I said, you know, it's about two to three times. But if you really look at it, uh, our energy resources of wind are relatively low. Let's say face that's that. Right. And uh, therefore, that is that is the prop perhaps the best place of the renewables. If you come to any other renewables, for instance, apart from hydro, which is also renewable, mm -hmm. on which there's a large amount of issues regarding displacement, even run-of-the-mill, run-of-the-river projects, there is some resistance, but relatively much less. But certainly large hydroelectric projects, there is a resistance. The third would be, for instance, when you take issues of biomass. No, but what about solar? I'm coming to that last because it is the most expensive. When you take biomass, for instance, you can say biomass perhaps would be twice as expensive as a coal-fired coal plant. But in India, biomass is not that easily available in the sense there are competing requirements. Absolutely. So therefore, it's a, it's a dicey area. Yes, there is small biomass plants are possible. Right. You have to have basically energy plantations, but not competing with food, food grains and other uh, right. commercial crops. So we will need to take Coming a, a to little that. break. And once we've taken the break, we'll come back to solar, solar because I think everybody understands and hears about solar. And um, we would take a little break right now from this discussion, but please don't go away. We'll be back with this discussion, and that's to start the second phase, we will talk about the potential of solar energy, what the status of the technology is in the world and here, uh, and come back. I have great hopes of solar thermal, but my understanding is that if you really want to build large-scale solar thermal, which we will have to globally, mm -hmm. at some point you will run out of fossil fuels in any case. Now, you really need, therefore, cheaper energy sources. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching Climate Matters with Nitin Desai and uh, Prabir Purkasta. Prabir, come back. Uh, before the break, you were beginning to tell us about solar. Uh, we have great hopes and the, the National Action Plan on Climate Change also talks about solar energy. There are huge investments being made. Is it a really viable renewable cost-wise, emission-wise, um, energy output-wise? Let's put it this way. Let's separate the two parts of solar. One is solar thermal, one is solar photovoltaic. Mm -hmm. Let me talk about solar thermal because what we are really talking about concentrated sources of power which can really power cities and industries and that's really if it has to. It has to come from largely solar thermal, maybe in the deserts. That's the supposed to be the blueprint for solar large scale electricity production. Now, solar thermal costs at the moment are really the cost of fabrication, which is the cost of steam, right. really, in that sense. And if you put the fabrication cost at current cost, probably a solar thermal station would cost today about four to five times that of a coal-fired plant of equivalent size. Mm -hmm. One megawatt, 
20 crores as a 1 megawatt, say 5 crores for a coal power plant. But the problem again with solar is the plant load factor is about 21 percent, which means that you get again more. What about the electricity. photovoltaic? Photovoltaic is even less efficient and uh -huh. the cost is actually probably a little higher at the moment. I have great hopes of solar thermal, but my understanding is if you really want to build large scale solar thermal, which we will have to globally, mm. at some point you're going to run out of fossil fuels in any case. Now, you really need, therefore, cheaper energy sources to be able to fabricate those kind of steel okay. plants and therefore to be able to put the solar but when you operate. talk about solar and all of these renewables, there's a question that's begging to be asked. Let, let me ask you this. Is nuclear energy uh, a viable option? Is it a low carbon? Is it renewable? Uh, where do you think in our energy policy and planning? It is a low carbon option. Whether it is viable or not is an open question. Right. Particularly if we were to take into account the uh, costs of disposal of the long-term waste, etc. So viability, I know, I, I cannot right. say definitely clearly that it, yes, it is, but it surely is a low carbon option. How and expensive you can, is All it? of these things, whether you're talking of solar, I, uh, the fact is today the cheapest energy technologies are fossil fuel using technologies. Yes. Let's be absolutely clear about that. Yes. There's no point in running away from that. And within that, there are some possibilities. You know, you can switch to gas and so on, which helps a little, but that's the reality. The, what I would say is that in all of these areas, what I look for is establishing a presence, not because it's viable today, but in a sense, you can't just wait till it becomes viable before you start be building up competencies, capacities, yes. engineering, et, et cetera. Uh, the second point I would like to make on some of these technologies is that there is a problem of a business model rather than of the technology itself. For instance, in the case of wind, once we started integrating it better into the grid, it took off. It, it, it really uh, helped. We may face similar problems. How much of solar thermal we can integrate into the grid uh, is an open question. But uh, these are the sorts of things that I would urge that we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. Don't judge these things simply in terms of today's Today, viability. Correct. Ask yourself what's it going to be like if, uh, if oil has peaked. So what is your strategic planning for energy What is your strategic use? planning? Are you going to get coal at the present prices forever? Right. If you look at the numbers, the extra demand for coal from India and China alone in a 2030 context is roughly an extra million tons of coal has to be shipped out of presumably Australia right. every day. Yes. Now you yeah, think no, that's clearly not that viable. Price? That's at today's price, you won't get it at today's price. Even that's people who don't say. follow the energy thing. Just one thing before we move away from the renewable debate. There's this big thing about biofuels and that biofuels should be, we already have a very aggressive biofuel policy with blending up to 20%. Um, what is your view on the biofuel approach, particularly of India, which is Jatropha based and very biomass based? There are concerns of its competition with food security, etc. Where do you see the biofuel policy uh, that is Jetrofa based? Where do you see it going? Most of the numbers that I have seen suggest that if you are taking away land from its use in fi food fiber production into something for which you, from which you're going to get biofuels, it's not worth it. The only sort of things which would be worthwhile, ethanol or biofuels would be worthwhile, is that which you could probably use from ce you know, pure cellulosic material rather than something which can be used as food or fiber. Mm -hmm. And that technology is not there. So my own sense is that uh, it, it's again one of those things where you have to do something in order to maintain a competence and a presence. But it's not today's technology. It's not something that would work without some measure of her support from the government. That and also the very dangerous uh, implications for food security. Probably there's one thing that comes up every now and then in the discussion on carbon and uh, energy, etc., and that is rural India's use of um, biomass for cooking and for uh, also for lighting. And the smokeless chula, the improved cooking stove, has been around forever. Oh. Where would you realistically place this as an option? Do we really have a good improved s cooking stove? Do we really have a smokeless chula? If, it, if we really have one, I mean, if the technology is already there, why isn't it flying off the shelves and into the homes of village people? Let's put it this way. The smokeless chula, which is really efficient, costs 900 rupees a chula. At that cost, I would say 
the real option is to give them LPG. Correct. You know, so effectively you divert the biomass into more productive use mm -hmm. rather than the chula where you should really be giving LPG for the villager. One of the nice photographs one can see nowadays is women carrying the LPG cylinder on their head mm -hmm. instead of the trundling with large masses of head loads of, head loads of, wood, of yes. wood. So I think the long term or the medium term or the short term solution would be really providing uh, LPG for cooking. That I and think you think that's a so viable much. option? I think so. And, I think and it has what, what to be do you done. think is the fate of the uh, smokeless chula? Do we just abandon it or do we need to... You see, we have, been, we have been in this game as a part of the People Science Network for a long time. Mm. The, my sense is that that is it not taken off for 30 years. It's not going to take off now. So you Effectively, sort of you should really look at LPG, which people will accept very easily, does not have large capital costs, and people are good. Uh, and we know, have enough gas? I think we have if we want to. You see, mm. the question again is what do you want to do? If you want to put it <coughs> into, say, uh, you know, to only elite homes, of course there is not enough gas. But you pipe up the cities and you provide the LPG to the rural areas, I think that's a viable option. Mm. I think it's very much a possible option because you are now getting uh, gas available in India. Large gas fines are already there. Gas is better distributed in the globe than oil is. Than oil. So therefore, you have better access to gas if you want to. And if you pipe up the cities, you free up the gas for uh, the, the LPG for the rural areas. And you think that's the way to go for rural uh, I think you have to fuel. give them good fuel. You can't give them chulas and say, we'll give you more efficient chulas, just pay 1,000 rupees. That won't work. No, it won't yeah. work, unless you have huge subsidies on that. Um, the question that also comes up repeatedly in every climate change conference is this pie chart with agriculture being such a huge emitter. And... Yes. And, and the fact that um, uh, that agriculture is said to be both a serious issue with developing countries because of the large extent of agriculture that we have. But what people don't mention at a time like that is what is the huge magnitude difference between industrial agriculture and the subsistence agriculture, which area-wise India um, and, and countries like us engage in. Uh, what do you think, is there what, your experience of the international debate, Nathan? what do you think is re realistic there and how can India counter this? And does India counter it? Basically, the focus there, of course, is much more on methane uh, emissions from paddy fields and uh, uh, which, so uh, which data have also been uh, countered by India. And then also there's lots of work which needs to be done still. A couple of points one could make. First, suppose what I'm focusing attention on is the increase in the... Uh, ambient carbon uh, mm -hmm. beyond the industrial revolution, then in a sense what I should be focusing attention on is what is it that has led to that increase right. rather than what was the base level. Uh, in a sense, a large part of the agricultural emissions have been there forever. Mm -hmm. it's, it, they're not sort of, they're not something that has happened right. in the past 10 years or 20 years or 50 years or 100 years. They've been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a certain increase because the area and the rice has increased but also the productivity of rice has improved enormously. So I'd say there are things, but there are things that we can do. For instance, there's a lot of work. Uh, this is an interesting example of synergy. There is work which is being done on low water use in rice and sugar yes. cane. Yes. Now that will also have a payoff in terms of methane. Absolutely. You know, if I have, if I, if I use that SRI technology yes. for rice cultivation, yes. which actually is very desirable from a water efficiency and point from of the and but it give me a great benefit in terms of methane. Yes, in uh, fact, it is being popularized all across India. Uh, it is being done, in, and it's in, and in people, but people are doing. No farmer will do it just for methane, but if you start project doing it for for the purposes of saving on scarce water, right. that will work yes. because there's a direct payoff. Right. You know, there's a very important point to consider, which Deepan has raised says earlier. Effectively, you have to look at what is increasing, not what is the component. And in that, methane has not been rising for the last 20 years. It has stabilized. Yeah. And in fact, the increase of methane came from industrial use. That fact, you are getting natural gas and some of it is leaking, and you are flaring, and yeah. so on. So, pipeline leakages even today. So you are not really looking at methane from point of view of the pie chart, but is it increasing? And global warming, let's be very clear, we are here because there is global warming, otherwise it would be a ball of ice. 
So we need a certain amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and we need a certain amount of global warming. Mm. What we don't need is continuous increase of global warming. Correct. And that's what the industrial emissions have caused. And that's when you start bringing up fossil reservoirs of fossil fuel and then burn it. That's when you get the increase, not by the natural cycle which converts from carbon to carbon in which methane is only an intermediate step. Let's Correct. be very clear. Correct. Methane lasts four to five years in the atmosphere. It breaks down very quickly. Correct. CO2 lasts forever. Correct. So you have a continuous carbon cycle in the atmosphere which is steady, which is steady state carbon cycle. Mm -hmm. We are not talking of that and that is what is agriculture. What we are talking about is really something else altogether. Mm -hmm. These are the extra emissions which come when you burn reservoirs of fossil fuel, which you that have. That and ground. when you have mechanization, which is one way of burning reservoirs of, uh, of fossil fuel. You always burn fossil fuel at Correct. the end of it. Yeah, mechanization means I, I, I give out carbon dioxide <coughs> when I exhale. Yeah, we are not talking about the carbon dioxide I give out when I exhale. But I am talking about the carbon dioxide I emit or carbon monoxide I emit if I am smoking a cigarette. Mm. That's the difference. The but coming back to agriculture, and I think this is important for the viewers to, to understand that uh, the kind of figures that have been put out as the emissions of methane, etc., from, uh, from Indian cows and cattle and from Indian paddies are highly inflated because the studies that have been done in this country uh, show that methane emissions are much lower. And now studies being done in, uh, and quoted in scientific journals show that indigenous breed of cattle that are free grazing have much lower uh, methane emissions. And that's, uh, that's, that's logical because they don't have uh, access to enriched feeds. High protein see, feeds that will, will raise have the meat. Look at the cow yeah. over there to cow over here to see the it's difference in size. They are stall fed, they don't even Absolutely. move. And here they are really browsing all over. Right. So the, the, those right. issues are settled. Now those issues have really come down to methane is not increasing. Is not but as nitrous oxide. But let me just get nitrous down. Oxide. Sorry, nitrous oxide, nitrous oxide, nitrous oxide, oxide is with your transportation sector. Is, is, is and landfills are and basically landfills. for landfills. But I need one quick answer, very short one from each of you. And that is that from the development perspective, uh, what is our uh, industrial sector and our energy consumption looking like? Do we, for our energy consumption, manage to raise that many jobs and increase the GDP? Or are we not very efficient in that? Quick one. We just have a little bit of time left. Uh, I would say that basically India has a reasonably efficient uh, uh, energy sector, uh, so use of unit, energy. Yeah. Uh, I think the energy sector itself needs to perhaps be much better. We all know about power losses, etc. Right. Uh, and I think we probably have not exploited enough the scope for energy at conservation and efficiency. Prabir, see, for every unit, do we really unit efficiently create jobs? And for a unit of electricity, you create a certain GDP. Today, given the industrial sector you have, you are not Thank creating you. jobs. Thank that you. is the reality. That is the tragedy, and that is where we can have an improvement. Thank you very much for watching Climate Matters. You've had a very interesting discussion on energy use. We would welcome your questions, responses, and comments. Please email us at climatematters at gmail.com.